This is a Willow audiobook. The Marvelous Land of Oz by L. Frank Baum Read by Stephen Alexander Chapter 6 Jack Pumpkinhead's Ride to the Emerald City At daybreak, Tip was awakened by the Pumpkinhead. He rubbed the sleep from his eyes, bathed in a little brook, and then ate a portion of his bread and cheese. Having thus prepared for a new day, the boy said, Let us start at once. Nine miles is quite a distance, but we ought to reach the Emerald City by noon if no accidents happen. So the pumpkin head was again perched upon the back of the sawhorse, and the journey was resumed. Tip noticed that the purple tint of the grass and trees had now faded to a dull lavender, and before long this lavender appeared to take on a greenish tinge that gradually brightened as they drew nearer to the great city where the scarecrow ruled. The little party had travelled but a short two miles upon their way when the road of yellow brick was parted by a broad and swift river. Tip was puzzled how to cross over, but after a time he discovered a man in a ferry boat approaching from the other side of the stream. When the man reached the bank, Tip asked, Will you row us to the other side? Yes, if you have money, returned the ferryman, whose face looked cross and disagreeable. But I have no money, said Tip. None at all, inquired the man. None at all, answered the boy. Then I'll not break my back rowing you over, said the ferryman decidedly. What a nice man, remarked the pumpkin head, smilingly. The ferryman stared at him, but made no reply. Tip was trying to think, for it was a great disappointment to him to find his journey so suddenly brought to an end. I must certainly get to the Emerald City, he said to the boatman. But how can I cross the river if you do not take me? The man laughed, and it was not a nice laugh. Ha 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 ha! That wooden horse will float, said he, and you can ride him across. As for the pumpkin headed loon who accompanies you, let him sink or swim. It won't matter greatly which. Don't worry about me, said Jack, smiling pleasantly upon the crabbed ferryman. I'm sure I ought to float beautifully. Tip thought the experiment was worth making, and the sawhorse, who did not know what danger meant, offered no objections whatever. So the boy led it down into the water and climbed upon its back. Jack also waded in up to his knees and grasped the tail of the horse so that he might keep his pumpkin head above the water. Now, said Tip, instructing the sawhorse, if you wiggle your legs, you will probably swim, and if you swim, we shall probably reach the other side. The sawhorse at once began to wiggle its legs, which acted as oars, and moved the adventurers slowly across the river to the opposite side. So successful was the trip that presently they were climbing wet and dripping up the grassy bank. Tip's trouser legs and shoes were thoroughly soaked, but the sawhorse had floated so perfectly that from his knees up the boy was entirely dry. As for the pumpkin head, every stitch of his gorgeous clothing dripped water. The sun will soon dry us, said Tip, and anyhow, we are now safely across in spite of the ferryman and can continue our journey. I didn't mind swimming at all, remarked the horse. Nor did I, added Jack. They soon regained the road of yellow brick, which proved to be a continuation of the road they had left on the other side, and then Tip once more mounted the pumpkin head upon the back of the sawhorse. If you ride fast said he. The wind will help to dry your clothing. I will hold on to the horse's tail and run after you. In this way we will all become dry in a very short time. Then the horse must step lively, said Jack. 
I'll do my best, returned the sawhorse cheerfully. Tip grasped the end of the branch that served as tail to the sawhorse and called loudly, Get up! The horse started at a good pace and Tip followed behind. Then he decided they could go faster, so he shouted, Trot! Now the sawhorse remembered that this word was the command to go as fast as he could, so he began rocking along the roads at a tremendous pace, and Tip had hard work, running faster than he ever had before in his life to keep his feet. Soon he was out of breath, and although he wanted to call whoa to the horse, he found he could not get the word out of his throat. Then the end of the tail he was clutching, being nothing more than a dead branch, suddenly broke away and the next minute the boy was rolling in the dust of the road, while the horse and its pumpkin-headed rider dashed on and quickly disappeared in the distance. By the time Tip had picked himself up and cleared the dust from his throat so he could say, whoa, there was no further need of saying it, for the horse was long since out of sight, so he did the only sensible thing he could do. He sat down and took a good rest, and afterward began walking along the road. Sometime I will surely overtake them, he reflected, for the road will end at the gates of the Emerald City, and they can go no further than that. Meantime, Jack was holding fast to the post, and the sawhorse was tearing along the road like a racer. Neither of them knew Tip was left behind, for the pumpkin head did not look around, and the sawhorse couldn't. As he rode, Jack noticed that the grass and trees had become a bright emerald green in colour, so he guessed they were nearing the Emerald City even before the tall spires and domes came into sight. At length, a high wall of green stone, studded thick with emeralds, loomed up before them, and fearing the sawhorse would not know enough to stop, and so might smash them both against this wall, Jack ventured to cry, Whoa! as loud as he could. So suddenly did the horse obey that had it not been for his post, Jack would have been pitched off head foremost and his beautiful face ruined. That was a fast ride, dear father, he exclaimed. And then, hearing no reply, he turned around and discovered for the first time that Tip was not there. This apparent desertion puzzled the pumpkin head and made him uneasy. And while he was wondering what had become of the boy, and what he ought to do next under such trying circumstances, the gateway in the green wall opened, and a man came out. This man was short and round, with a fat face that seemed remarkably good-natured. He was clothed all in green, and wore a high peaked green hat upon his head, and green spectacles over his eyes. Bowing before the pumpkin head, he said, "'I am the guardian of the gates of the Emerald City.' May I inquire who you are, and what is your business? My name is Jack Pumpkinhead, returned the other, smilingly. But as to my business, I haven't the least idea in the world what it is. The guardian of the gates looked surprised, and shook his head as if dissatisfied with the reply. What are you, a man or a pumpkin? he asked politely. Both, if you please answered Jack. "'And this wooden horse, is it alive?' questioned the guardian. The horse rolled one knotty eye upward and winked at Jack. Then it gave a prance and brought one leg down on the guardian's toes. "'Ouch!' cried the man. "'I'm sorry I asked that question, but the answer is most convincing. "'Have you any errand, sir, in the Emerald City?' "'It seems to me that I have.' replied the pumpkin head seriously. But I cannot think what it is. My father knows all about it, but he is not here. This is a strange affair, very strange, declared the guardian. But you seem harmless. Folks do not smile so delightfully when they mean mischief. As for that, said Jack, I cannot help my smile, for it is carved on my face with a jackknife. Well, come with me into my room, resumed the guardian, and I will see what can be done for you. So Jack rode the sawhorse through the gateway into a little room built into the wall. The guardian pulled a bell cord, 
and presently a very tall soldier, clothed in a green uniform, entered from the opposite door. This soldier carried a long green gun over his shoulder, and had lovely green whiskers that fell quite to his knees. The guardian at once addressed him, saying, "'Here is a strange gentleman who doesn't know why he has come to the Emerald City, or what he wants. Tell me, what shall we do with him?' The soldier with the green whiskers looked at Jack with much care and curiosity. Finally, he shook his head so positively that little waves rippled down his whiskers, and then he said, "'I must take him to His Majesty the Scarecrow.' "'But what will His Majesty the Scarecrow do with him?' asked the guardian of the gates. "'That is His Majesty's business,' returned the soldier. "'I have troubles enough of my own. All outside troubles must be turned over to His Majesty. So put the spectacles on this fellow, and I'll take him to the royal palace.' So the guardian opened a big box of spectacles and tried to fit a pair to Jack's great round eyes. Oh, "'I haven't a pair in stock that will really cover those eyes up,' said the little man with a sigh. "'And your head is so big that I shall be obliged to tie the spectacles on.' "'But why need I wear spectacles?' asked Jack. "'It's the fashion here,' said the soldier, "'and they will keep you from being blinded by the glitter and glare of the gorgeous Emerald City.' Oh! exclaimed Jack. Tie them on by all means. I don't wish to be blinded. Nor I, broke in the sawhorse, so a pair of green spectacles was quickly fastened over the bulging knots that served it for eyes. Then the soldier with the green whiskers led them through the inner gate, and they at once found themselves in the main street of the magnificent Emerald City. Sparkling green gems ornamented the fronts of the beautiful houses, and the towers and the turrets were all faced with emeralds. Even the green marble pavement glittered with precious stones, and it was indeed a grand and marvellous sight to one who beheld it for the first time. However, the pumpkin head and the sawhorse, knowing nothing of wealth and beauty, paid little attention to the wonderful sights they saw through their green spectacles. They calmly followed after the green soldier, and scarcely noticed the crowds of green people who stared at them in surprise. When a green dog ran out and barked at them, the sawhorse promptly kicked at it with its wooden leg and sent the little animal howling into one of the houses. But nothing more serious than this happened to interrupt their progress to the royal palace. The pumpkin head wanted to ride up the green marble steps and straight into the scarecrow's presence, but the soldier would not permit that. So Jack dismounted, with much difficulty, and a servant led the sawhorse around to the rear, while the soldier with the green whiskers escorted the pumpkin head into the palace by the front entrance. The stranger was left in a handsomely furnished waiting room, while the soldier went to announce him. It so happened that at this hour His Majesty was at leisure, and greatly bored for want of something to do, so he ordered his visitor to be shown at once into his throne room. Jack felt no fear or embarrassment at meeting the ruler of this magnificent city, for he was entirely ignorant of all worldly customs. But when he entered the room and saw for the first time His Majesty the Scarecrow seated upon his glittering throne, he stopped short in amazement. Chapter 7 His Majesty the Scarecrow I suppose every reader of this book knows what a scarecrow is, but Jack Pumpkinhead, never having seen such a creation, was more surprised at meeting the remarkable king of the Emerald City than by any other one experience of his brief life. His Majesty the Scarecrow was dressed in a suit of faded blue clothes, and his head was merely a small sack stuffed with straw, upon which eyes, ears, a nose and a mouth had been rudely painted to represent a face. The clothes were also stuffed with straw, and that so unevenly or carelessly that His Majesty's legs and arms seemed more bumpy than was necessary. Upon his hands were gloves with long fingers, and these were padded with cotton. Wisps of straw stuck out from the monarch's coat, and also from his neck and boot tops. 
Upon his head, he wore a heavy golden crown set thick with sparkling jewels, and the weight of this crown caused his brow to sag in wrinkles, giving a thoughtful expression to the painted face. Indeed, the crown alone betokened majesty. In all else, the Scarecrow King was but a simple scarecrow, flimsy, awkward, and unsubstantial. But if the strange appearance of His Majesty the Scarecrow seemed startling to Jack, no less wonderful was the form of the pumpkin head to the Scarecrow. The purple trousers and pink waistcoat and red shirt hung loosely over the wooden joints Tip had manufactured, and the carved face on the pumpkin grinned perpetually, as if its wearer considered life the jolliest thing imaginable. At first, indeed, His Majesty thought his queer visitor was laughing at him, and was inclined to resent such a liberty. But it was not without reason that the Scarecrow had attained the reputation of being the wisest personage in the land of Oz. He made a more careful examination of his visitor, and soon discovered that Jack's features were carved into a smile, and that he could not look grave if he wished to. The king was the first to speak. After regarding Jack for some minutes, he said, in a tone of wonder, "'Where on earth did you come from? And how do you happen to be alive?' "'I beg your majesty's pardon,' returned the pumpkin head, "'but I do not understand you.' "'What don't you understand?' asked the Scarecrow. Why? I don't understand your language. You see, I came from the country of the Gillikins, so that I am a foreigner. Ah, to be sure, exclaimed the Scarecrow. I myself speak the language of the Munchkins, which is also the language of the Emerald City. But you, I suppose, speak the language of the Pumpkinheads? Exactly so, your majesty, replied the other, bowing so it will be impossible for us to understand one another. That is unfortunate, certainly, said the Scarecrow thoughtfully. We must have an interpreter. What is an interpreter? asked Jack. A person who understands both my language and your own. When I say anything, the interpreter can tell you what I mean, and when you say anything, the interpreter can tell me what you mean for the interpreter can speak both languages as well as understand them. That is certainly clever, said Jack, greatly pleased at finding so simple a way out of the difficulty. So the Scarecrow commanded the soldier with the green whiskers to search among his people until he found one who understood the language of the Gillikins as well as the language of the Emerald City, and to bring that person to him at once. When the soldier had departed, the Scarecrow said, Won't you take a chair while we are waiting? "'Your Majesty forgets that I cannot understand you,' replied the pumpkin head. "'If you wish me to sit down, you must make a sign for me to do so.' The Scarecrow came down from his throne and rolled an armchair to a position behind the pumpkin head. Then he gave Jack a sudden push that sent him sprawling upon the cushions in so awkward a fashion that he doubled up like a jackknife and had hard work to untangle himself. "'Did you understand that sign?' asked his majesty politely. Perfectly, declared Jack, reaching up his arms to turn his head to the front, the pumpkin having twisted around upon the stick that supported it. You seem hastily made, remarked the scarecrow, watching Jack's efforts to straighten himself. Not more so than your majesty, was the frank reply. There is this difference between us, said the scarecrow, that whereas I will bend but not break, you will break but not bend. At this moment the soldier returned, leading a young girl by the hand. She seemed very sweet and modest, having a pretty face and beautiful green eyes and hair. A dainty green silk skirt reached to her knees, showing silk stockings embroidered with pea pods and green satin slippers with bunches of lettuce for decorations instead of bows or buckles. Upon her silken waist, clover leaves were embroidered, and she wore a jaunty little jacket, trimmed with sparkling emeralds of a uniform size. "'Why, it's little Jelly a Jam!' exclaimed the Scarecrow as the green maiden bowed her pretty head before him. "'Do you understand the language of the Gillikins, my dear?' "'Yes, Your Majesty,' she answered, "'for I was born in the North Country.' "'Then you shall be our interpreter.' 
said the Scarecrow, and explain to this pumpkin head all that I say, and also explain to me all that he says. Is this arrangement satisfactory? he asked, turning towards his guest. Very satisfactory indeed, was the reply. Then ask him, to begin with, resumed the Scarecrow, turning to Jellia. What brought him to the Emerald City? But instead of this, the girl, who had been staring at Jack, said to him, You are certainly a wonderful creature. Who made you? A boy named Tip, answered Jack. What does he say? inquired the Scarecrow. My ears must have deceived me. What did he say? He says that your majesty's brains seem to have come loose, replied the girl demurely. The Scarecrow moved uneasily upon his throne and felt of his head with his left hand. What a fine thing it is to understand two different languages, he said with a perplexed sigh. Ask him, my dear, if he has any objection to being put in jail for insulting the ruler of the Emerald City. I didn't insult you, protested Jack indignantly. Tut, tut, cautioned the Scarecrow. Wait until Jellia translates my speech. What have we got an interpreter for if you break out in this rash way? All right, I'll wait, replied the pumpkin head in a surly tone, although his face smiled as genially as ever. Translate the speech, young woman. His Majesty inquires if you are hungry, said Jellia. Oh, not at all, answered Jack more pleasantly, for it is impossible for me to eat. It's the same way with me remarked the Scarecrow. What did he say, Jellia, my dear? He asked if you were aware that one of your eyes is painted larger than the other, said the girl mischievously. Don't you believe her, your majesty, cried Jack. Oh, I don't, answered the Scarecrow calmly. Then, casting a sharp look at the girl, he asked, Are you quite certain you understand the languages of both the Gillikins and the Munchkins? Quite certain, your majesty, said Jellia Jam, trying hard not to laugh in the face of royalty. Then how is it that I seem to understand them myself? inquired the scarecrow. Because they are one and the same, declared the girl, now laughing merrily. Does not your majesty know that in all the land of Oz but one language is spoken? Is it indeed so? cried the scarecrow, much relieved to hear this. Then I might easily have been my own interpreter. It was all my fault, your majesty, said Jack, looking rather foolish. I thought we must surely speak different languages, since we came from different countries. This should be a warning to you never to think, returned the scarecrow severely. For unless one can think wisely, it is better to remain a dummy, which you most certainly are. I am, I surely am, agreed the pumpkin head. It seems to me, continued the Scarecrow more mildly, that your manufacturer spoiled some good pies to create an indifferent man. I assure your majesty that I did not ask to be created, answered Jack. Ah, it was the same in my case, said the king pleasantly. And so, as we differ from all ordinary people, let us become friends. With all my heart, exclaimed Jack. What? Have you a heart? asked the Scarecrow, surprised. No, that was only imaginative. I might say, a figure of speech, said the other. Well, your most prominent figure seems to be a figure of wood, so I must beg you to restrain an imagination which, having no brains, you have no right to exercise, suggested the Scarecrow warningly. To be sure, said Jack without in the least comprehending. His Majesty then dismissed Jellia Jam and the soldier with the green whiskers, and when they were gone, he took his new friend by the arm and led him into the courtyard to play a game of quoits. Chapter 8 General Ginger's Army of Revolt Tip was so anxious to rejoin his man Jack and the sawhorse that he walked a full half the distance to the Emerald City without stopping to rest. Then he discovered that he was hungry, and the crackers and cheese he had provided for the journey had all been eaten. 
While wondering what he should do in this emergency, he came upon a girl sitting by the roadside. She wore a costume that struck the boy as being remarkably brilliant, her silken waist being of emerald green and her skirt of four distinct colours, blue in front, yellow at the left side, red at the back and purple at the right side. Fastening the waist in front were four buttons, the top one blue, the next yellow, the third red and the last purple. The splendour of this dress was almost barbaric, so Tip was fully justified in staring at the gown for some moments before his eyes were attracted by the pretty face above it. Yes, the face was pretty enough, he decided, but it wore an expression of discontent coupled to a shade of defiance or audacity. While the boy stared, the girl looked upon him calmly. A lunch basket stood beside her, and she held a dainty sandwich in one hand and a hard-boiled egg in the other, eating with an evident appetite that aroused Tip's sympathy. He was just about to ask a share of the luncheon, when the girl stood up and brushed the crumbs from her lap. "'There,' said she. "'It is time for me to go. "'Carry that basket for me, "'and help yourself to its contents if you are hungry.' Tip seized the basket eagerly and began to eat, following for a time the strange girl without bothering to ask questions. She walked along before him with swift strides, and there was about her an air of decision and importance that led him to suspect she was some great personage. Finally, when he had satisfied his hunger, he ran up beside her and tried to keep pace with her swift footsteps. A very difficult feat, for she was much taller than he, and evidently in a hurry. "'Thank you very much for the sandwiches,' said Tip as he trotted along. "'May I ask your name?' "'I am General Ginger,' was the brief reply. "'Oh,' said the boy, surprised. "'What sort of a general?' "'I command the army of revolt in this war,' answered the general, with unnecessary sharpness. "'Oh,' he again exclaimed, "'I didn't know there was a war.' "'You were not supposed to know it.' she returned, for we have kept it a secret, and considering that our army is composed entirely of girls, she added with some pride, it is surely a remarkable thing that our revolt is not yet discovered. It is indeed, acknowledged Tip, but where is your army? About a mile from here, said General Ginger. The forces have assembled from all parts of the land of Oz, at my express command. For this is the day we are to conquer His Majesty the Scarecrow and wrest him from the throne. The army of revolt only awaits my coming to march upon the Emerald City. Well, declared Tip, drawing a long breath, this is certainly a surprising thing. May I ask why you wish to conquer His Majesty the Scarecrow? "'Because the Emerald City has been ruled by men long enough for one reason,' said the girl. "'Moreover, the city glitters with beautiful gems "'which might far better be used for rings, bracelets and necklaces. "'And there is enough money in the king's treasury "'to buy every girl in our army a dozen new gowns. "'So we intend to conquer the city and run the government to suit ourselves.' Ginger spoke these words with an eagerness and decision that proved she was in earnest. "'But war is a terrible thing,' said Tip thoughtfully. "'This war will be pleasant,' replied the girl cheerfully. "'Many of you will be slain,' continued the boy in an awed voice. "'Oh, no,' said Ginger. "'What man would oppose a girl, or dare to harm her? "'And there is not an ugly face in my entire army.' Tip laughed. Perhaps you're right, said he, but the guardian of the gate is considered a faithful guardian, and the king's army will not let the city be conquered without a struggle. The army is old and feeble, replied General Ginger scornfully. His strength has all been used to grow whiskers, and his wife has such a temper that she has already pulled more than half of them out by the roots. When the wonderful wizard reigned, the soldier with the green whiskers was a very good royal army, for people feared the wizard. But no one is afraid of the scarecrow, so his royal army don't count for much in time of war. After this conversation, they proceeded some distance in silence, 
and before long reached a large clearing in the forest, where fully 400 young women were assembled. These were laughing and talking together as gaily as if they had gathered for a picnic instead of a war of conquest. They were divided into four companies, and Tip noticed that all were dressed in costumes similar to that worn by General Ginger. The only real difference was that while those girls from the Munchkin country had the blue strip in the front of their skirts, those from the country of the Quadlings had the red strip in front, and those from the country of the Winkies had the yellow strip in front, and the Gillikin girls wore the purple strip in front. All had green waists representing the Emerald City they intended to conquer, and the top button on each waist indicated by its colour which country the wearer came from. The uniforms were jaunty and becoming, and quite effective when massed together. Tip thought this strange army bore no weapons whatever, but in this he was wrong, for each girl had stuck through the knot of her back hair two long, glittering knitting needles. General Ginger immediately mounted the stump of a tree and addressed her army. Friends, fellow citizens and girls, she said, we are about to begin our great revolt against the men of Oz. We march to conquer the Emerald City to dethrone the Scarecrow King, to acquire thousands of gorgeous gems, to rifle the royal treasury, and to obtain power over our former oppressors. Hurrah, said those who had listened, but Tip thought most of the army was too much engaged in chattering to pay attention to the words of the general. The command to march was now given, and the girls formed themselves into four bands or companies, and set off with eager strides towards the Emerald City. The boy followed after them, carrying several baskets and wraps and packages which various members of the Army of Revolt had placed in his care. It was not long before they came to the green granite walls of the city and halted before the gateway. The guardian of the gate at once came out and looked at them curiously, as if a circus had come to town. He carried a bunch of keys swung round his neck by a golden chain, his hands were thrust carelessly into his pockets, and he seemed to have no idea at all that the city was threatened by rebels. Speaking pleasantly to the girls, he said, "'Good morning, my dears. What can I do for you?' "'Surrender instantly,' answered General Ginger, standing before him and frowning as terribly as her pretty face would allow her to. "'Surrender?' echoed the man, astounded. "'Why, it's impossible!' It's against the law. I never heard of such a thing in my life. Still you must surrender, exclaimed the general fiercely. We are revolting. You don't look it, said the guardian, gazing from one to another admiringly. But we are, cried Ginger, stamping her foot impatiently. And we mean to conquer the Emerald City. Good gracious, returned the surprised guardian of the gates. What a nonsensical idea. Go home to your mothers, my good girls, and milk the cows and bake the bread. Don't you know it's a dangerous thing to conquer a city? We are not afraid, responded the general, and she looked so determined that it made the guardian uneasy. So he rang the bell for the soldier with the green whiskers, and the next minute was sorry he had done so for immediately he was surrounded by a crowd of girls who drew the knitting needles from their hair and began jabbing them at the guardian with the sharp points dangerously near his fat cheeks and blinking eyes. The poor man howled loudly for mercy and made no resistance when Ginger drew the bunch of keys from around his neck. Followed by her army, the general now rushed to the gateway, where she was confronted by the Royal Army of Oz which was the other name for the soldier with the green whiskers. Halt! he cried, and pointed his long gun full in the face of the leader. Some of the girls screamed and ran back, but General Ginger bravely stood her ground and said reproachfully, Why, how now? Would you shoot a poor defenceless girl? No, replied the soldier, for my gun isn't loaded. Not loaded? No for fear of accidents, and I've forgotten where I hid the powder and shot to load it with. But if you'll wait a short time, I'll try to hunt them up. Don't trouble yourself, said Ginger cheerfully. Then she turned to her army and cried, Girls, 
The gun isn't loaded! Hooray! shrieked the rebels, delighted at this good news, and they proceeded to rush upon the soldier with the green whiskers in such a crowd that it was a wonder they didn't stick the knitting needles into one another. But the royal army of Oz was too much afraid of women to meet the onslaught. He simply turned about and ran with all his might through the gate and toward the royal palace, while General Ginger and her mob flocked into the unprotected city. In this way was the Emerald City captured without a drop of blood being spilled. The army of revolt had become an army of conquerors. Chapter 9 The Scarecrow Plans an Escape Tip slipped away from the girls and followed swiftly after the soldier with the green whiskers. The invading army entered the city more slowly, for they stopped to dig emeralds out of the walls and paving stones with the points of their knitting needles. So the soldier and the boy reached the palace before the news had spread that the city was conquered. The Scarecrow and Jack Pumpkinhead were still playing at quoits in the courtyard when the game was interrupted by the abrupt entrance of the Royal Army of Oz, who came flying in without his hat or gun, his clothes in sad disarray, and his long beard floating a yard behind him as he ran. "'Tally one for me,' said the Scarecrow calmly. "'What's wrong, my man?' he added, addressing the soldier. "'Oh, your majesty, your majesty, the city is conquered!' gasped the royal army, who was all out of breath. "'This is quite sudden,' said the Scarecrow. "'But please go and bar all the doors and windows of the palace, while I show this pumpkin head how to throw a quoit.' The soldier hastened to do this, while Tip, who had arrived at his heels, remained in the courtyard to look at the scarecrow with wondering eyes. His Majesty continued to throw the quoits as coolly as if no danger threatened his throne, but the pumpkin head, having caught sight of Tip, ambled towards the boy as fast as his wooden legs would go. "'Good afternoon, noble parent!' he cried delightedly. "'I'm glad to see you are here!' That terrible sawhorse ran away with me. I suspected it, said Tip. Did you get hurt? Are you cracked at all? No, I arrived safely, answered Jack, and His Majesty has been very kind indeed to me. At this moment, the soldier with the green whiskers returned, and the scarecrow asked, By the way, who has conquered me? A regiment of girls gathered from the four corners of the land of Oz replied the soldier, still pale with fear. "'But where was my standing army at the time?' inquired His Majesty, looking at the soldier gravely. "'Your standing army was running,' answered the fellow honestly, "'for no man could face the terrible weapons of his invaders.' "'Well,' said the Scarecrow after a moment's thought, "'I don't mind much the loss of my throne, "'for it's a tiresome job to rule over the Emerald City.' and this crown is so heavy that it makes my head ache. But I hope the conquerors have no intention of injuring me, just because I happen to be the king. I heard them say, remarked Tip with some hesitation, that they intend to make a rag carpet of your outside and stuff their sofa cushions with your inside. Then I am really in danger, declared His Majesty positively, and it will be wise for me to consider a means to escape. "'Where can you go?' asked Jack Pumpkinhead. "'Why, to my friend the Tin Woodman, who rules over the Winkies and calls himself their Emperor,' was the answer. "'I am sure he will protect me.' Tip was looking out the window. "'The palace is surrounded by the enemy,' said he. "'It is too late to escape. They would soon tear you to pieces.' The Scarecrow sighed. "'In an emergency,' he announced. It is always a good thing to pause and reflect. Please excuse me while I pause and reflect. But we are also in danger, said the pumpkin head anxiously. If any of these girls understand cooking, my end is not far off. Nonsense, exclaimed the scarecrow. They're too busy to cook even if they know how. But should I remain here a prisoner for any length of time, protested Jack, I'm liable to spoil. Ah, then you would not be fit to associate with, returned the Scarecrow. 
The matter is more serious than I suspected. You, said the pumpkin head gloomily, are liable to live for many years. My life is necessarily short, so I must take advantage of the few days that remain to me. There, there, don't worry, answered the scarecrow soothingly. If you'll keep quiet long enough for me to think, I'll try to find some way for us all to escape. So the others waited in patient silence, while the scarecrow walked to a corner and stood with his face to the wall for a good five minutes. At the end of that time, he faced them with a more cheerful expression upon his painted face. Where is the sawhorse you rode here? he asked the pumpkin head. Why, I said he was a jewel, so your man locked him up in the royal treasury, said Jack. It was uh, the only place I could think of, your majesty, added the soldier, fearing he had made a blunder. It pleases me very much, said the scarecrow. Has the animal been fed? Oh, yes, I gave him a heaping peck of sawdust. Excellent, cried the scarecrow. Bring the horse here at once. The soldier hastened away, and presently they heard the clattering of the horse's wooden legs upon the pavement as he was led into the courtyard. His Majesty regarded the steed critically. He doesn't seem especially graceful, he remarked musingly. But I suppose he can run. He can indeed, said Tip, gazing upon the sawhorse admiringly. Then, bearing us upon his back, he must make a dash through the ranks of the rebels and carry us to my friend the Tin Woodman, announced the Scarecrow. He can't carry four, objected Tip. No, but he may be induced to carry three, said His Majesty. I shall therefore leave my royal army behind. For, from the ease with which he was conquered, I have very little confidence in his powers. Still, he can run, declared Tip, laughing. I expected this blow, said the soldier sulkily, but I can bear it. I shall disguise myself by cutting off my lovely green whiskers. And after all, it is no more dangerous to face those reckless girls than to ride this fiery, untamed wooden horse. Perhaps you are right, observed His Majesty. But for my part, not being a soldier, I am fond of danger. Now, my boy, you must mount first, and please sit as close to the horse's neck as possible. Tip climbed quickly to his place, and the soldier and the scarecrow managed to hoist the pumpkin head to a seat just behind him. There remained so little space for the king that he was liable to fall off as soon as the horse started. Fetch a clothesline, said the king to his army, and tie us all together. Then, if one falls off, we will all fall off. And while the soldier was gone for the clothesline, his majesty continued, It is well for me to be careful, for my very existence is in danger. I have to be as careful as you do, said Jack. Not exactly, replied the scarecrow, for if anything happened to me, that would be the end of me. But if anything happened to you, they could use you for seed. The soldier now returned with a long line and tied all three firmly together, also lashing them to the body of the sawhorse, so there seemed little danger of their tumbling off. Now throw open the gates, commanded the scarecrow, and we will make a dash to liberty or to death. The courtyard in which they were standing was located in the centre of the great palace, which surrounded it on all sides. But in one place a passage led to an outer gateway, which the soldier had barred by order of his sovereign. It was through this gateway His Majesty proposed to escape, and the royal army now led the sawhorse along the passage and unbarred the gate, which swung backward with a loud crash. Now, said Tip to the horse, you must save us all. Run as fast as you can for the gate of the city and don't let anything stop you. All right, answered the sawhorse gruffly, and dashed away so suddenly that Tip had to gasp for breath and hold firmly to the post he had driven into the creature's neck. Several of the girls who stood outside guarding the palace were knocked over by the sawhorse's mad rush. Others ran screaming out of the way, and only one or two jabbed their knitting needles frantically at the escaping prisoners. Tip got one small prick in his left arm, which smarted for an hour afterwards, 
but the needles had no effect upon the Scarecrow or Jack Pumpkinhead, who never even suspected they were being prodded. As for the Sawhorse, he made a wonderful record upsetting a fruit cart, overturning several meek-looking men, and finally bowling over the new guardian of the gate, a fussy little fat woman appointed by General Ginger. Nor did the impetuous charger stop then. Once outside the walls of the Emerald City, he dashed along the road to the west with vast and violent leaps that shook the breath out of the boy and filled the Scarecrow with wonder. Jack had ridden at this mad rate once before, so he devoted every effort to holding with both hands his pumpkin head upon its stick, enduring meantime the dreadful jolting with the courage of a philosopher. Slow him up! Slow him up! shouted the Scarecrow. My straw is shaking down into my legs! But Tip had no breath to speak, so the sawhorse continued his wild career unchecked and with unabated speed. Presently they came to the banks of a wide river, and without a pause, the wooden steed gave one final leap and launched them all in mid-air. A second later, they were rolling, splashing and bobbing about in the water, the horse struggling frantically to find a rest for its feet, and its riders being first plunged beneath the rapid current, and then floating upon the surface like corks. Chapter 10. The Journey to the Tin Woodman Tip was well soaked and dripping water from every angle of his body, but he managed to lean forward and shout in the ear of the sawhorse, Keep still, you fool! Keep still! The horse at once ceased struggling and floated calmly upon the surface, its wooden body being as buoyant as a raft. What does that word, fool, mean? inquired the horse. It is a term of reproach, answered Tip, somewhat ashamed of the expression. I only use it when I'm angry. Then it pleases me to be able to call you a fool in return, said the horse, for I did not make the river, nor put it in our way. So only a term of reproach is fit for one who becomes angry with me for falling into the water. That is quite evident, replied Tip, so I will acknowledge myself in the wrong. Then he called out to the pumpkin head, Are you all right, Jack? There was no reply. So the boy called to the king, Are you all right, your majesty? The scarecrow groaned. I'm all wrong somehow, he said in a weak voice. How very wet this water is! Tip was bound so tightly by the cord that he could not turn his head to look at his companions. So he said to the sawhorse, Paddle with your legs toward the shore. The horse obeyed, and although their progress was slow, they finally reached the opposite river bank at a place where it was low enough to enable the creature to scramble upon dry land. With some difficulty, the boy managed to get his knife out of his pocket and cut the cords that bound the riders to one another and to the wooden horse. He heard the scarecrow fall to the ground with a mushy sound, and then he himself quickly dismounted and looked at his friend Jack. The wooden body with its gorgeous clothing, still sat upright on the horse's back. But the pumpkin head was gone, and only the sharpened stick that served for a neck was visible. As for the scarecrow, the straw in his body had shaken down with the jolting and packed itself into his legs and the lower part of his body, which appeared very plump and round while his upper half seemed like an empty sack. Upon his head, the scarecrow still wore the heavy crown, which had been sewed on to prevent his losing it, but the head was now so damp and limp that the weight of the gold and jewels sagged forward and crushed the painted face into a mass of wrinkles that made him look exactly like a Japanese pug dog. Tip would have laughed had he not been so anxious about his man Jack. But the scarecrow, however damaged, was all there, while the pumpkin head that was so necessary to Jack's existence was missing. So the boy seized a long pole that fortunately lay near at hand and anxiously turned again toward the river. Far out upon the waters, he sighted the golden hue of the pumpkin, which gently bobbed up and down with the motion of the waves. At that moment it was quite out of Tip's reach, but after a time it floated nearer and still nearer until the boy was able to reach it with his pole and draw it to the shore. Then he brought it to the top of the bank, carefully wiped the water from its pumpkin face with his handkerchief, and ran with it to Jack, 
and replaced the head upon the man's neck. Dear me, were Jack's first words. What a dreadful experience. I wonder if water is liable to spoil pumpkins. Tip did not think a reply was necessary, for he knew that the scarecrow also stood in need of his help. So he carefully removed the straw from the king's body and legs and spread it out in the sun to dry. The wet clothing he hung over the body of the sawhorse. If water spoils pumpkins, observed Jack with a deep sigh, then my days are numbered. I've never noticed that water spoils pumpkins, returned Tip, unless the water happens to be boiling. If your head isn't cracked, my friend, you must be in fairly good condition. Oh, my head isn't cracked in the least, declared Jack more cheerfully. Then don't worry, retorted the boy. Care once killed a cat. Then, said Jack seriously, I am very glad indeed that I am not a cat. The sun was fast drying their clothing, and Tip stirred up his majesty's straw so that the warm rays might absorb the moisture and make it as crisp and dry as ever. When this had been accomplished, he stuffed the scarecrow into symmetrical shape and smoothed out his face so that he wore his usual gay and charming expression. "'Thank you very much,' said the monarch brightly, as he walked about and found himself to be well balanced. "'There are several distinct advantages in being a scarecrow. "'For if one has friends near at hand to repair damages, nothing very serious can happen to you.' "'I wonder if hot sunshine is liable to crack pumpkins,' said Jack with an anxious ring in his voice. "'Not at all, not at all,' replied the scarecrow gaily. All you need fear, my boy, is old age. When your golden youth has decayed, we shall quickly part company. But you needn't look forward to it. We'll discover the fact ourselves and notify you. But come, let us resume our journey. I am anxious to greet my friend, the Tin Woodman. So they remounted the sawhorse, Tip holding to the post, the pumpkin head clinging to Tip, and the scarecrow with both arms around the wooden form of Jack. "'Go slowly, for now there is no danger of pursuit,' said Tip to his steed. "'All right,' responded the creature, in a voice rather gruff. "'Aren't you a little horse?' asked the pumpkin head politely. The sawhorse gave an angry prance and rolled one knotty eye backward toward Tip. "'See here,' he growled. "'Can't you protect me from insult?' "'To be sure,' answered Tip soothingly. "'I'm sure Jack meant no harm.' And it will not do for us to quarrel, you know. We must all remain good friends. I'll have nothing more to do with that pumpkin head, declared the sawhorse viciously. He loses his head too easily to suit me. There seemed no fitting reply to this speech, so for a time they rode along in silence. After a while, the scarecrow remarked, This reminds me of old times. It was upon this grassy knoll that I once saved Dorothy from the stinging bees of the Wicked Witch of the West. Do stinging bees injure pumpkins? asked Jack, glancing around fearfully. They're all dead, so it doesn't matter, replied the Scarecrow. And here is where Nick Chopper destroyed the Wicked Witch's grey wolves. Who was Nick Chopper? asked Tip. That is the name of my friend, the Tin Woodman, answered His Majesty. And here is where the winged monkeys captured and bound us and flew away with little Dorothy, he continued, after they had travelled a little way farther. Do winged monkeys ever eat pumpkins? asked Jack with a shiver of fear. I do not know, but you have little cause to worry, for the winged monkeys are now the slaves of Glinda the Good, who owns the golden cap that commands their services, said the scarecrow reflectively. Then the stuffed monarch became lost in thought, recalling the days of past adventures, and the sawhorse rocked and rolled over the flower-strewn fields and carried its riders swiftly upon their way. Twilight fell by and by, and then the dark shadows of night. So Tip stopped the horse, and they all proceeded to dismount. "'I'm tired out,' said the boy, yawning wearily and the grass is soft and cool. Let us lie down here and sleep until morning. I can't sleep, said Jack. 
I never do, said the scarecrow. I do not even know what sleep is, said the sawhorse. Still, we must have consideration for this poor boy, who is made of flesh and blood and bone, and gets tired, suggested the scarecrow, in his usual thoughtful manner. I remember it was the same way with little Dorothy. We always had to sit through the night while she slept. I'm sorry, said Tip meekly, but I can't help it. And I'm dreadfully hungry too. Here is a new danger, remarked Jack gloomily. I hope you are not fond of eating pumpkins. Not unless they're stewed and made into pies, answered the boy laughing. So have no fears of me, friend Jack. What a coward that pumpkin head is, said the sawhorse scornfully. You might be a coward yourself if you knew you were liable to spoil, retorted Jack angrily. There, there, interrupted the scarecrow. Don't let us quarrel. We all have our weaknesses, dear friends, so we must strive to be considerate of one another. And since this poor boy is hungry and has nothing whatever to eat, let us all remain quiet and allow him to sleep. For it is said that in sleep a mortal may forget even hunger. Thank you, exclaimed Tip gratefully. Your majesty is fully as good as you are wise, and that is saying a good deal. He then stretched himself upon the grass, and using the stuffed form of the scarecrow for a pillow, was presently fast asleep. <laughs>